Hi, it's Jesse. Today on the show, you know him as Conan O'Brien's right-hand man for nearly three decades, from films such as Elf, and from his podcast, Three Questions with Andy Richter. It's, well, you guessed it, Andy Richter. I was relied far too much upon as a child, so I never knew that feeling of, like, I enjoy freedom. Yeah. I enjoy servitude. <laughs> <laughs> This is Dinners on Me, and I'm your host, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Doing talk shows has never been my favorite thing. It's an honor to be asked, but also the experience can often feel like uh, being shot out of a cannon. I find that being a good guest, and I, I actually think I am a good guest, is a bit of an art form. You have a comically short amount of time, usually four to seven minutes, to come out, tell a few stories, promote whatever you're on the show to promote, make some jokes, maybe play a game or two. For me, a successful appearance means being charming but not cloying, funny but not crass, subversive but not overly controversial. All this while being true to myself and having good chemistry with the host. I don't know, maybe this sounds easy to other people, but for me it feels like a challenge on the squid game. While on Modern Family, I think I was a guest on just about every late night show that was running, from Leno to Letterman, Kimmel to Fallon, Colbert to Conan. And Conan was always one of my favorite shows to do, not only because it felt comforting to talk to a fellow self-effacing redhead, but also because of the presence of Conan's friendly sidekick, Andy Richter. Now, calling Andy a sidekick feels dismissive to the chemistry he's brought to all three of Conan O'Brien's talk shows. I was always so happy to appear on his shows because it never felt like work, and so much of that great energy was because of Andy Richter. I would just show up and have a good time. Now, I got to spend a little bit more time with Andy recently when I was a guest on his very popular podcast, Three Questions with Andy Richter. It was just so great getting to know him on a deeper level as a guest on his turf. I knew after our chat, I wanted to dig even deeper with him and have him as a guest on my podcast. It's the circle of hosts. You can approach in three minutes, please. We're just having a conversation. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> For free food, I will. Oh, no, you're paying. What? Did you bring your wallet? You know I have you're... Apple Pay. I brought Andy to Connie and Ted's in West Hollywood, which is owned by restaurateur Michael Simarusti, who Angelinos might also know from his other L.A. restaurant, the Michelin-starred Providence. Connie and Ted's is inspired by his East Coast upbringing. His grandfather was a fisherman in Rhode Island. With nautical knickknacks in the modern sun-drenched space, it serves a sort of upscale clam shack feel. You come to Connie and Ted's for the classics, oysters, clams, crabs, and of course, lobster, which is flown in specially from Massachusetts twice a week. The spot is a favorite of Andy's, so I thought, why not bring him someplace where he feels right at home? Okay, let's get to the conversation. <laughs> well, how old are your kids? Well, four, and yeah. Coco's four, right? Yes. Yeah, your, your stepdaughter. Yeah. Well, she's and mine. She's legal now. She's mine. Oh, okay. I adopted her. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, four. And then my younger one is, he'll be two in November. So what's the math there? 21 months or something? Something like that. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's close together, though. But yeah, so I- It's I, a lot of work. It, it is a lot of work. Yeah. Um, how has it been, like, having a four-year-old- You've already been through it once. Yeah. Twice. In some ways it's easy. And in some ways, and in some ways it's embarrassing how, not so much now, people are used to it. Mm -hmm. But when I, when people started to find out that, because my older kids are 23 and 18. Yes. People would act as if I, it was some act of heroism on my yeah. part. Yeah. And I'm like, I had, well, first of all, it's like dad has it a lot easier than mom. Like, I fell in love with somebody that has a kid. I like raising kids. Mm -hmm. And the sort of secret part that I felt like nobody was realizing is that like, for I haven't like 16 to 18 years of not having to make any decisions. You know, like yeah. this, this child has freed me from my greatest existential fear, which is what should I do with myself right, right. now? Like what, like, what do I do now? I've never been good at answering that question. Yeah. And so now it's like, 
Oh my! On Saturday, what am I going to do with my you Saturday? Have I'm going to take care of this child. You know, it's so interesting because um, for some people, for many people, that exact thing is what is terrifying. Yeah, that they don't have that freedom to like do whatever they want to do. I, luckily, I was, uh, I was relied far too much upon as a child, so mm. I never knew that feeling of like, I enjoy freedom. Yeah, I enjoy. Servitude. <laughs> <laughs> I am fine. Hey. That was fine. To get you started on lunch today. Yes. Do you care for something to drink? We have yes. sparkling Saratoga, still water. Um, yeah, actually, sparkling water sounds really good for okay. me. Uh, an iced tea, please. An iced tea it is. Yes. Good to see you again. We haven't seen you in a while. Thank you. I know. I moved to Pasadena, so I... I it's like a little hike. It's a little bit of a hike, yeah. Well, thank you for making it over. And, and I also... See you, Jesse. I married yeah. somebody with a small child, so I don't do anything anymore. <laughs> going out to you dinner chase. is... You I know, it. I know. <laughs> uh, going out to dinner, though, is like... And also, I married a vegetarian, oh. so... That puts a that You're puts a crimp. You're throwing a lot at us right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. And you're placing blame everywhere but yourself. I, the reason I haven't been here is not my fault. It's not my fault. Um, we have a selection of oysters coming out. Nice. So I hope you'll enjoy what Chef Sam is selecting I will for eat you whatever today. Has, whatever you put out. And then after that, we're going to give you a selection of Connie and Ted's iconic dishes. So great. They'll come after that. So beautiful. Uh, if you have so any questions, hungry. let us know. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I also moved recently. I'm, I'm in Encino now. Oh, okay. You have good food in Pasadena. Because you had a nice, you had a beautiful house. In Los Feliz. Was it too small? And or I wouldn't say it was too small. It was too many stairs for oh. my growing family. I and, see, I see. You know, Rashida Jones is my, was my neighbor in Los Feliz. Yeah. And she brings her son in and immediately she's like, nope. And she just like, she kept picking him up. Like, no, not over there, not over there. And I was seeing in, in, in live time, like how impossible it would be to baby proof this house. Yes. Like, beautiful wrought iron work with like these curling like spikes. I was like, oh, that's a place where you can like <laughs> be, literally fish hook yourself. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm seeing this in a whole different light now. That's the thing. When you get a little toddler, who runs around mm -hmm. and who like is just a, a danger machine, yeah. uh, constantly picking things <laughs> up and putting it in their mouth. Yeah, it, you go places like the first time I went to Disneyland with a little kid with yeah. my with my son, I realized your life is defined by how far you can let your child get away from you so true. without having to freak out. Yeah, and at Disneyland you can let him get. 50, 75 yards away. And you, you can, I've dropped you them can off at the him. gate and just said, see you at eight. <laughs> Here you go. There's 20 bucks a piece. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we did an episode of, of Modern Family at Disneyland. And my storyline with Eric Stone Street was that we were panicked about losing Lily and we had her on a leash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Disneyland. And how like all the other parents were judging, judging us. Yes. But then we met another set of parents with their kids on the leash as well, and we're having a conversation with them, but the kids are getting all tangled up like like dogs would if you're walking them on the sidewalk. And we're so we're constantly like stepping over the leash, like taking it behind our back, trying yeah, to like yeah. untangle. And it was just this physical comedy that we thought was so funny. But like now that I have a kid, I'm like, oh, I get the allure right. of a leash. Absolutely. I mean, I haven't gotten to that point yet. And I yeah. think, I think. I'm pretty good about keeping up on these things. I think that they're still pretty controversial. Are they? Yes, they, they definitely are. Yeah. And I have a twin brother and sister. They're actually my half brother and sister, but they're nine years younger than me. Okay. And, and I mean, there was no sort of like mom will take care of them. It was right. an, immediately I was like handed a baby with a di full diaper and like, here, change this child. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. So my brother, my older brother and I definitely were very much involved. And there were times when we would, not all the time, but there were times when we'd be like, we got to break out the leashes. Yeah. And we would have them on like, <laughs> oh, it was like, you know, when people walk two dogs we together. Them a lot on slack. Some, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, but it, at a certain point, it's like, I don't care. Yeah. You when you're outnumbered, it truly yes. is. It's like, well, you, you were least, just, your job is to keep them alive. Like I was, I was introduced to the, oh shit, my child is gone yeah. at like age yeah, 11 yeah, yeah. or 12. Way too young yeah, to be yeah, dealing yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> did you, where did you meet Jen? Uh, we met on Hinge. We you met did. online. Yeah, oh. it was my first real experience uh, doing that. I, you know, I, I split up with my wife, and it took. You know, I mean, it was. 
It was, you know, it was the well, worst thing I've ever been through. Yeah, you've been, been very together. open about yeah. how that affected you and sort of gutted you. We'd been together for 27 years and t- married for 25. So it was just, it was awful. And moving out of the house that I lived at with, in with my kids was just the absolute worst part. And my, you know, I talked to my sister, my younger sister who'd been divorced, and she said, she's like, well, it, it'll take really a long time before we feel settled down enough to really kind of even feel like, in any way serious about getting back together with somebody. Mm-hmm. So, they, you know, it's a couple of three years. And I was like, what? Yeah. I don't have time for that. I, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but she was right. It did. It took a while. What was that experience like? Was it, it hard? It was, well, it was exciting yeah. in some ways because it was like just the notion of something new. But yeah, it, I mean, it was nerve wracking and sure. it was kind of terrifying and, And, you know, you feel like an old shoe, you know, you don't, like, it's not, like, you don't feel like, hi. Hi, guys. Hello. Oysters incoming. Thank you. Do you have any kind of Tabasco-y, hot saucy kind of? God, the demands just don't stop. Well, it kills the E. coli. You can't yell at people. Well, listen. (laughs) Thank you so much. That's so kindly. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we um, we met on Hinge, and I had been dating, but I just kind of was sort of stuck a little bit. Yeah. And thought, well, and, you know. Was that the first time you signed up for the app? Yeah. Oh, well, that's no, that's not entirely true. Uh, my friend Nikki Glazer, the comedian. Yeah, I know Nikki. Shortly after I split up, uh, Nikki said, oh, you got to get on Raya. You know, mm-hmm. the one that's, like, supposedly yeah. celebrity. There's, like, a waiting list. To yeah, and you have ahead. to be okay to be in on it. Uh-huh. She said, I'll recommend you. And I said, okay. And I, I, she recommended me, and I signed up. And I was in no position to self-examine and, like, yeah. write cute little things about myself. I Because I just felt like, <laughs> You're just- I'm an old shoe, you know. <laughs> like, I'm garbage. What kind of music do I like? Garbage music. <laughs> um, and it was, it was also... You had to pick a piece of music, and everything I plugged in <laughs> was just too old for it. Like, it was like, I couldn't find like, anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, well, I mean, just like, no, but I mean, like, uh, like Aretha Franklin, or I don't know. They didn't even have these songs that I was putting in, so I don't even remember what I settled on. God, I'm desperate to know. I think, like, I think I settled on an Al Green, which I felt was much okay. too forward, you know. <laughs> Because that's like a, come on, baby, let's go. Is that go. like, let's get it on? Yeah, a like, little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it was that. But, <laughs> but um, so funny. I, and I put it together, finally. And I'm like, uh, and then pick, pick, pick photos of yourself, mm-hmm. which is truly. Oh, that's the worst. Like, oh, I mean, I just, hate even like submitting a headshot. Oh, it's just, I can't. So I picked the photos and I, and I kind of, you know, send it up. And, and then I was kind of browsing through and I realized, oh, I thought I just had made it and was saving it, but it was like, it was out oh. and in circulating. And it was only about a half an hour running. It was like, yeah, delete, delete. And, and, and you weren't ready. Squash the whole thing. And I just couldn't. I just, uh, it was my first experience. And this held true a little bit to Hinge too, but I felt like if you went by Raya, you would think that in Los Angeles, at any given time, there were like, a hundred women in their forties leaping in the surf yeah. joyously. And yeah. I was just like, this is not my crowd. Yeah. But I really, I mean, Jan and I, it was very short time that I was even on the thing. And I met her because we went out on a couple of dates and then she came over to my house and I cooked her dinner, uh, which is, you know, I, I understand the power of that. Sure. And, you know, it's very powerful. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and and then I just started hanging out at her house, and I met her daughter, and uh, and I started finding myself driving home feeling very very happy, oh. and and like in a like I say a way that snuck up on me, and a a big deal to me that that a, a realization that crept up on me about her too is that like she did not need me like she had a full like. She has her own business. She has a career that she's been, you know, involved in for years and years. Uh, does well at yeah. it. Is well respected in her community. Decided to have a baby and had a baby on her own. You know, like mm. I never had to. I never felt any kind of pressure to behave a certain way or be sure. anybody other than myself. And I never. I didn't have that with other people right. that I dated. You know. Right. 
I always think about people who have had really long relationships or long marriages and then have decided to end them. And I, I don't know. I feel like there's still, I don't consider that a, a failure of I a don't, marriage. I don't either. I consider, you know, I mean, I, you have two beautiful children from this and you, you spent a quarter of a century, you know, building a life with someone. Yeah. Um, I think that's really remarkable. Um, Thank you. And I, I, that's what I, I felt when I kind of made a public announcement about it. I considered it a success because yeah. it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. And the notion that you're going to get together with somebody and, and it's going to be forever. Yeah. That's just, I, it's a, it's kind of a, you know. Well, it's an unfair. It's a, um, weird, it's, it's a bit of a strange concept. It, you know, it's, I think it's, 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 you know, stifling a flame before yeah, it has a chance yeah. even like you don't don't put the, that as those expectations on anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, if it if it works out, that's great. And if it doesn't, you know, yeah. you have to. And I'm sure you know. I know heartbreak is also a huge part of that. And when you have to let something like that go, it's very devastating as well. I mean, yeah. I I know your your parents were divorced. You uh, at a young age. Yeah. Um, my parents also were divorced. I was older when when that happened, I, and I consider their marriage a success. You know, I have myself and my two siblings to yeah. to uh, they have they have us to show for it. And but you know, I also saw them go through a lot of heartbreak too. And it's are they okay with each other now? Yeah, or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my folks uh, split up because my dad came out because uh, my dad's gay, um, and so it's. A, that, it was like a, it's a different sort of, right. it's yeah. its own special f form of divorce. Yes. Um, but they, you know, they maintained uh, a friendship for, you know, I mean, there was a few years where, because my mom was blindsided by it. Mm. Um, you know, my mom was born in 1940. My dad was born in 1937, I think. Mm. And it just, it was a different time. It but it's also, different. I have the modern perspective. Sure. You know, where it didn't, you know, there were plenty of, like, and I mean, my and I'm not, that isn't to say that my dad is a big flamboyant swish or anything, but he definitely, you know, it's like. Once you know, you're like, oh. Yeah. I mean, that was sort of the same with my parents, I think, once. There were major signs, and I think we definitely did talk about this on, yeah. on your podcast, but there are major signs, and they just turned a blind eye to it, and then seemingly was very surprised when I when I did come out, and I was like, you guys, I mean, all the signs were there, and right. now, you know, with some uh, with some space away from it, it's very obvious. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. You know, they're like, oh, that's what that meant, and right. that's what that meant. Exactly. Um, when... When I, when your father came out to you, it was a few years after the divorce, and yeah. you know you were probably were you old enough to understand what gay was, or what did that mean to well, you when you were seven or eight? Uh, I think I think I didn't ha it didn't cause me to freak out or anything. Mm -hmm. I knew enough to know that it wasn't something to go back home to Yorkville, Illinois, and uh -huh. and spread around like you know when I went got back to fourth grade or whatever yeah. it was. And he kind of wrapped it up with the birds and bees talk, mm -hmm. too, um, which he had said he had sent he had sent my mom a pop up book about sex and reproduction that she would not let us have. And that annoyed him. So the next time we were with him and it was, I think, Christmas time in Springfield, Illinois, which is at my grandparents. Uh -huh. And he said to my brother and I said, come on, we're going to the mall. We're going to the mall. And we got in the car and we drove to a park and parked in the parking lot of the of the park. And he went through the whole birds and bees stuff and then and said, and then, but some people are attracted to the same sex and that's me and I'm gay and, you know, and, and we're like, oh, okay. And he got to the end of it and, uh, <laughs> and he starts pulling out and, and heading back home. And I was like, Wait, aren't we going to the mall? <laughs> and he's like, No, we're not going to the mall. I just said that to, you know, as a cover for yeah. Grandma and Grandpa. And I was like, Oh, fuck, I want to go to the mall. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I mean, you're gay and that's whatever. What that's fine. On, that's yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah, and it was, and it was never a big deal. Honestly, it, I mean, uh, my dad and I are estranged and, uh, it's it's a bigger deal to him, I think, than it is to anybody else. And it's hard to convince him sometimes 
that that isn't the case. Right. I mean, I always think about how grateful I am. And I was born in 75. And, you know, there was a lot of years in there that it was really not, you know, that was the AIDS epidemic. Scary. Terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I was too young to be sexually active at that time. But, like, there was such a stigma around being gay with just that existing. Yes. You know, and so I, I really, but I am, I am grateful that I, it wasn't even earlier that I, I was having to experience this because it, I, I do think I had it easier than say your your dad yeah. did for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Now your old your your son's gay. Yeah. And when did he come out to you? He came out when he was about eleven. Oh wow. Yeah. He um, we were walking away. We had just eaten dinner at a place on La Brea uh, in our old neighborhood, and and we were walking down the street, and I was holding his hand. And he said to me, he said, Dad, do you know what gay or bi means? And no I boy, said, do I. <laughs> I high-fived him. Yeah. I said, fuck yeah, boy, do I ever. Um, I said, yes, I do. He said, well, he goes, I think that's what I am. And I said, okay, well, thank you for telling me. And then, as I like to say, we never spoke of it again, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, not because of me, right. but because, like, we didn't need to, like, okay. But isn't that kind of refreshing that oh, you didn't have to speak of it again? It's fantastic. Like, with my family, from the, from like, all the time oh, they wanted to talk about. I was like, you guys, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, like, yeah. Can we move on from this. This it, is not that interesting. It was, and I, and I, because I also felt like it's his business now. Yeah. Like, I didn't want my, I, I don't, my parents knowing about, about like what stuff? my about no. my sexuality, no. like any the particulars of it in any way. Like, no. mom, here's what kind of woman I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. Ooh, yuck. No. It's you not, think it doesn't that, matter. Any of that sort of open mindedness comes from just the fact that your dad w- was was gay and or is gay and, and came out to you at such a young age. Possibly, but And I, it was not a big deal to you. Yeah, but I also but I mean but then that uh, you know it, that's also uh, compounded by my mother and my mother's reaction to him, which, you know, once she got beyond the heartbreak of it, she didn't care. Yeah. Um, and she was very open about it. And my mother, I have to really give my mother credit, too, because she was very much about mental health. Mm-hmm. And when... You know, like I started seeing what she would call a family counselor when I was maybe 12 or 13 because Mm -hmm. she had remarried and there was all kinds of adjustment. And she very much believed in the talking cure, as they call it. Which is kind of, at that time, pretty incredible because I think people, there was a great stigma around There still is. People, you know, I mean, I've talked about mental health on things and I'll have people come up and Mm say, I, after... You know, 30 years of being miserable went to a therapist because I heard you on yeah. a podcast, which I just, in one sense, wow. I, I'm, I'm touched by it. I'm, I'm, I feel great about that. But then in another sense, I'm like, what? what? Really? That's what it, yeah. oh, Jesus, you know? Yeah. I, don't un- I, don't, I don't understand. I've never understood why mental health is treated any different than any other health. It's like, I, you know, when people would say like, I had, you know, like when I started going on antidepressants, I had friends that were like, oh, yeah, uh, isn't it going to stifle you creatively? Isn't it going to change your uh, your personality? Uh, I mean, are, can, are you going to eventually get off them? And I was just like, I was walking around with a bone sticking out of my leg. Yeah. You'd go get, go to the emergency room, get that fixed. Yeah. And I, it's like, I don't understand what the... There's, I think people just think that your brain is who you are and you can't fuck with it, which mm-hmm. is just like, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, yeah. you can. Yeah. You can. What's, it's, life is too short, you yeah. know? I think, you know, with, with the success of Modern Family, I just, I, something happened in me that I just, I, I, being a very private person, being a person who doesn't always like to share a ton about myself, I'm much better about it now, but like having that experience of being under a microscope really did something to me. And I, I, I came out of that experience a bit changed and would, would experience panic attacks more. And, yeah. you know, sometimes crowds. It I, is weird. I, I used to love meeting strangers on, a, on, on the train in New York and just chatting with just them. Just chatting with people. Yeah. And, you know, the, then I was like uh, nervous to meet people because I was like, well, what are their motives here? You know, are they going to want something from me? Yeah. I was noticing these changes in myself and a lot of it was, you know, mental. And, um, and I was, very stressed out about 
things that normally do not stress me out. And so I, I, I explored not only talk therapy, but yeah. um, medication as well. And, you know, I'm still figuring out how to use those tools for, uh, to their best ability. But, you know, it, it has been something that I've embraced. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm in that place where I'm sort of on the journey of yeah. figuring out what works for me and what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard you say this before, but you've been with the same therapist for a very long time. Long, long time. Yeah, since the early 90s. In fact, I just had a session. This My normal session is Thursdays, Thursday mornings. And um, and it's been mostly by me? the phone. No, oh. no. All right. We talk, I talked about me. <laughs> oh, I just luxuriated <laughs> in me. Um, no, and I mean, it's, I don't, I don't, plan on ever being fixed right it's it's a process and it'll it'll be an ongoing process what did depression look like for you when you were younger oh uh did it inertia yeah inertia sadness just sadness and inertia you know and um suicidal Mm. ideation has been something that has been with me for a long, long time. And I mean, and it periodically throughout my life, I have experienced never like, you know, I'm going to go to the hardware store and buy a rope. Right. But certainly sort of like, you know, I could go up on the roof of this building, right. you know, that kind of thing, just in a very sort of casual kind of right. way. And and it, it's a process that lots of people go through. And a lot of, you know, and people that I know and love have gone through it. And I think they just think that if they tell anybody, you know, somebody's going to check them into the hospital or something. But yeah. it's like, no, I mean, it's. Well, that's what, I mean, there's certainly days I remember thinking, especially when I was younger, like, you know, I was bullied as a kid. And I was like, well, this is not that much fun to yeah. be living this life every day. Yeah. And I never got to the point where I was like, I'm going to take myself out of the situation. But I do remember thinking, like, this isn't the most fun I've had on yes. a Wednesday. Yes, yes. Being stapled to this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can laugh about it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? I find it a little bit fascinating when you were going through your divorce that you were also, you know, actively on television. Yes. At that time, too. Yes. I remember having a fight with just a pretty bad fight, like early on in our relationship. Like, we, I wasn't even. Did your relationship predate the show? We met a year into it. Oh, okay. So, but he's kind of been with me through the entire. Run. I remember yeah. it, was an, it was an episode. It was the first episode with Nathan Lane, uh-huh. who is an idol of mine and someone I kind of knew a little bit in New York. But <clears throat> he was guesting on that episode. And I, meanwhile, at home, I was having a, a terrible fight with Justin. Mm-hmm. And again, it was early in our relationship. And so we weren't, you know, we we're sort of learning the tools of how to fight. Right. But it felt very big at the time. And yeah. I remember just being devastated and having to like, do the scene work with one of my acting idols and like feeling very unpresent. Yeah. But I remember acting with Nathan and thank God I've had many scenes with him after that. But like, I always remember the first day he was on set. I was like, Oh, that was such a bad day for me. Yeah. I mean, it really took over my, my whole being. And I'm thinking about you going through this pretty emotional thing and having to go out and sit with Conan and like be, you know, part of these conversations and be the, yeah. you know, funny. And I mean, was that, was it a helpful thing to be able to focus on or was it? Well, it's, cer- I mean, it's certainly in a career where you don't always have steady work. I mean, having that as a steady job yeah. as always was always a blessing yeah, of a kind. Sure. I, I had had some experience with it in like, in the first run of the Conan show and during the late night years, having having a lot of struggles with depression. And those sort of spilled over into kind of how I felt about the show. Um, and in many ways, the, the dissatisfaction that I had with myself falling over into the show was one of the reasons why I kind of left after mm-hmm. in the first part. It really, it all boiled down to I wanted to try something else. Yeah. But it also was all mixed up in depression and and bad behavior patterns that were, you know, that I was stuck in and that I was learning to, you know, learning to get out of. Yeah. So, yeah, I had had some experience in compartmentalizing and being like, you know, I don't like this. I'm going to shove it over Mm -hmm. here. But there's plenty. Oh, we got. Oh. 
Oh, 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 lobster roll. I got roll. myself a lobster roll. That is your cold lobster roll. Yes, thank you. Mayonnaise, Rhode Island. Nice. Blue cheese, gem lettuce. Thank you. And Jonah Crab. Okay, I got a double salad. And I'm going to bring you a soup spoon just in case you want to. I do want to try that. Taste. I got to try that. I made a meal out of apps. <laughs> I'm crazy that way. Mmm. <laughs> This is just basically New England chowder without well, the, the cream. flour. Yeah, and the cream. Mm. I love that's it. That's really good. The, I mean, the, the, the thing that also strikes me just as people who, you know, I mean, obviously you're in the public eye and, you know, it's hard enough to go through heartbreak and divorce. But then, you know, that you have to sort of make a statement on Twitter and then, yep. you know, you don't have to, but it's, it's going to come out anyway. Right. So you might as well, like, take control of the narrative. But then, you know, it's a story on People Magazine and it's like, it can't really be private. It's weird. It's very weird, it's yeah. It's weird. It's weird because I still just kind of feel like, why would anyone care to put that in print? And mm -hmm. I, like I say, intellectually, I understand, but I still am weirded out by it. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember specifics about the first time you met Conan? Um, yeah. Um, you guys hit it off pretty quickly. I mean- We did. And yeah, as we're talking about relationships, I mean, that's sort of been one of your- that Oh, might I, be I the say longest. I'm his TV wife. Yeah. You know, it's only like 60% a joke because mm -hmm. it is very much like being the, the spouse of a famous person because yeah. we're sort of together in a venture and, you know, we sort of are thought of as a duo, but I also, being places, standing next to him, mm -hmm. and like I say, it doesn't really, like it doesn't sting, I don't really get mad. Right. But I mean, I am human and there, <laughs> there were a number of times where someone would come up and say, I love the show, it'd be, you know, him and me together and another person maybe, um, but I specific, specifically remember one in Chicago, we were doing shows in Chicago, and it was me and him and Sona were going to get something to eat. And um, somebody stopped him, ran on and on and on about how much they love the show, crazy about the show, and could I get a picture? And he said, sure. And the person just handed, handed me the camera. phone and yeah. got a picture with him and never did any kind of like, oh, it's you too kind of thing, which I just, which made me feel like, yeah. You don't really, like... That literally happened to me and Julie Bowen in an airport, though, where someone handed her the camera to take a photo of the two of us. I was like, there's no way. They just must not have recognized you. <laughs> it's just, it's strange. It's like, yeah. are you lying and, like, buttering him up for some reason? Right. Where you right. don't really know the show that well? Or, right, right, right. You know, or is it this fake beard I'm wearing? <laughs> is it the wig? <laughs> but I know, but as I say, I never went, like... Oh, how how dare they not recognize me? Because I mean, why the fuck should anybody recognize? You know, um, no, it's I. You know, I don't. It is. A, it's a very silly life. Yeah, it's a very silly life. And I often, I I, was, I, I am struck so many times watching people in, and it's, it doesn't even have to be something that's like not that good. Mm -hmm. It can be something that's like kind of good, but just acting is one of the most so embarrassing, silly. embarrassing things a it's human so being can do. It's so funny that you say that because Ty Burrell and I would get the giggles so bad when we were shooting Modern Family because we would catch each other acting. Yes. And we'd be like, yeah. what are you doing? Why are you such an, you're a grown man, stop. What are you doing with your face? Yeah, like, yeah. And we would just get the giggles so bad. And so it got, Got to the point where, like, he could just see in the glint in my eye if I'm thinking that. And we would just start laughing, and then no one else in the scene would know why we're laughing. Because yeah. nothing had happened other than he caught my eye. And, like, you know, Steve and Chris, our, our creators, would come over, like, what's so funny? I was like, oh, we just, we're just, this job's so stupid. Like, we're just laughing <laughs> at how stupid this job is. Stupid? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm the movie Elf. Oh. James Conn, sometimes John Favreau would get, the director would get like a little serious. And I would just hear James Conn going, it's called Elf, John. Yeah. The movie's called Elf. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah, it is, isn't it? God, I yeah. love that movie so much. You know, I, I've thought about this, you know, when I was just looking at your 
the history of your career. I mean, you've done so many incredible things between like, you know, I love the, what is it, quintuplets or quadruplets on? Uh, quintuplets. Quintuplets, that's five. Yeah. On Arrested Development. You know, I, uh, um, so much great voiceover work. And then you also have this consistent beating drum of like 30 years with, with Conan on yeah. all three iterations of, of his show. I mean, do you ever like look back and be like, wow, how did I, that's pretty great. Like, how did I, how did I get here? I definitely, um, I, I did not always appreciate uh, how lucky I was. And, but th there again, like too, I, you know, I, I was a, unhappy a lot of the time. Yeah. And so it's hard to kind of take a, a good, healthy inventory of your situation when you're not happy. And I don't, you know, that's just like, I'm not blaming that on anybody or anything. It just was a fact of yeah. life. Like it's like I said, I said the other day online, it's like the thing they don't tell you about being alive is that it takes 40 or 50 years to get the hang of it. Oh, that's you know? such a great it, analogy. And yeah. it does. And I am, I am also convinced that like, you can't be as, and I, wise seems like too much. You can't be just as sort of settled and, and sure of yourself and just kind of have a handle on things when you're young. Cause it's like when, to be young, to be like, Young and good looking and smart, it's too powerful. <laughs> oh, it's too much oh, power me, centered in one area. Believe me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the kind of winding down of the TBS version of the Conan show, I had so many people that I had worked with for literally decades come up and say the most beautiful, meaningful things to me about what I had done for them or what I meant to them or how thankful they were. It was just, it, it was, impossible to not be transformed by it in a way that I still am carrying with me. And, you know, there's times I feel like show business has shut down now. It's like, I don't even understand like what's going on. So it, at times it, it's very easy to feel dissatisfied with the current moment. And I work really hard to remember that I have done stuff and with a group of people that I love, and that it means things to people, especially to young people. How has it been for you, you know, with these, with, you know, your, your podcast is so great. It's, it's, it's been going on for quite some time, right? Uh, five years now? Yeah, it's a while. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I got to be a guest on it. I've, you know, you've had so many incredible guests on, so many incredible conversations, but you know, you're really front and center on that. That is your, you. it's your show and you know, that's, somewhat of a new role and for you as someone who has been, you know, I don't want to call it a sidekick, but you know, you were. I know, I, that's what I was. Yeah. That's, that's the job title, yeah. you know. Side piece. Can we call you a side piece, <laughs> please? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, co-host, uh -huh. people will want to be nice and call me a co-host, but I wasn't the co-host. I was the piece. sidekick. I was the so side piece. Say what it is. It's a side piece. <laughs> uh, I did, I was, uh, interview adjacent for a million years sure. and they are different kinds of interviews like the conan interviews or at least you know on the tv they're so short and yeah. concentrated and punchy and yeah. get a laugh and we'll be right back you know mm -hmm. um when i started doing my podcast like i wanted to do an interview one i wanted to do it kind of you know with the, the basically therapeutic kind of angle yeah. like like Talk about your history. Talk about how it made you who you are. Um, and I was not good at it in the beginning, but it just, most everything I've gotten good at, I've done, I've gotten good at the, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, thousands of hours kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And now, now it's really a pleasure to do the show. And it's really fun. I go into their studios. I feel like a big grown-up radio man, you know. <laughs> um but I don't, but it's like, I'm still waiting for a TV show. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm still waiting to, I don't know, be Uncle Bob on something. Right. You know? Would you, you would like to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's my number one choice. Is, I mean, you know, the Conan show was great and I always loved it, but I always missed acting. Yeah. And that's what I set out to be. I set out to be a comedic a character actor, right, basically. Right. basically. Do you ever find that because you're so well known as yourself, for 30 years, do you ever find that it's a harder to break through to I, those opportunities? Well, first of all, I think that the casting process is just 
dumb. It's like, it's, what is it now? Even I don't even know. What I don't even know what it is. is. And yeah, you record yourself, which I absolutely hate, because yeah. then you have to find somebody else. That's talk about embarrassing. It's like <laughs> ask my son to read lines so I can audition for you know. Nothing's worse. I fired Justin as my like line reader. Oh, I will- my I fired my wife too, because she because she reads the the. The description oh, copy no. too. He exits she'll like, the room. she'll read. Yeah, she'll be like, she'll read her line, and then be, I can tell she's reading. He gets up and crosses to the window. Yeah. He looks out and looks back, and I'm like, just say the fucking lines, yeah, please. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, I hate that part. And casting, I, you know, it's frustrating because I would get this years ago when my Andy Richter controls the universe. The first show that I did after I left Conan. The first table read for all the big wigs, the head of Paramount Studios at the time, came up to me afterwards and said, wow, you really can act. I was like, yeah, Yeah. I'm I'm number one on the call sheet of this show that you're paying. Okay. And I'm getting now, too, I think because I was over doing the Conan show for all those years, I'm getting a lot of wow, he's a good actor, kind of like, or he can act kind of feedback on auditions that just feels a little like, uh, it's just exhausting. I, I don't I, I don't get yeah. offended or anything. I'm not a spiritual person, but I do believe in the, the concept of yin and yang and that like the better things are, like we get to enjoy so much yeah. fantastic aspects of what we do for a living that the downside is like going to be possibly as shitty. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, okay, all right, that's the <laughs> yeah, price of what admission. Comes with it, yeah. yeah. That was something Dan Savage said when he was on my show. And he's like, you cannot complain about the price of things mm-hmm. when you largely knew the price going in and you made the choice to do Interesting. it. Interesting. And he's like, it's just, it's no fun to hear somebody complain about something that they, said, I want this. Right. And, it, and it's very true. It's yeah, very true. I get that. Yeah. But no, no, that doesn't keep me from bitching. <laughs> doesn't keep me from bitching about things. <laughs> I mean, you gotta, fish has got to swim, you know. <laughs> Bird's got to fly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. This has been a joy. Thanks for Thank doing this Thank you for doing me. it. Yeah. Thank you for doing it. It's, how, it's, how did you like your reunion with oh, Audience Heads? It's fantastic. This place is so good. This episode of Dinners on Me was recorded at Connie and Ted's in West Hollywood, California. Next week on Dinners on Me, you know him as the youngest dumpy sibling, Luke, on Modern Family. It's Nolan Gould. We'll get into what child stardom was like, our favorite onset memories, and making life out of the spotlight. Dinners On Me is a production of Sony Music Entertainment and a kid named Beckett Productions. It's hosted by me, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. It's executive produced by me and Jonathan Hirsch. Our showrunner is Joanna Clay. Our associate producer is Angela Vang. Sam Baer engineered this episode. Hans Dale She composed our theme music. Our head of production is Sammy Allison. Special thanks to Tamika Balance kolasny and Justin Makita. I'm Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Join me next week.